Okay, welcome to the Slate Belt Heritage Center's first virtual program. Uh, I'm Melissa Huff. I'm uh, president of the Board of Trustees of the Slate Belt Heritage Center, which is located in the heart of the Slate Belt. Our mission is to collect, interpret, uh, preserve, and present the histories and the culture of the 10 municipalities within the Bangor and Penargil School District. Now, like many of you, uh, we've been at home during this pandemic. So this is our first try at doing a virtual presentation for our program night. Uh, we hope you'll be a little bit um, sympathetic to our, our first shot here. And uh, uh, it will be posted, we're recording this, and it will be posted then. Uh, you can get to it through our uh, Facebook page and uh, our YouTube site. Now I have a few announcements uh, and um, though we've been physically closed for several months, we have been working. Our textile book is available. It's wonderful. If you don't have one yet, you can get one uh, by sending us a check for $30 and we can send it out to you or uh, we can uh, accept a check for $20 and then we'll make a, an appointment, a time when you can safely come and pick it up. Our, our regularly scheduled programs will be jumbled for a while. Normally during June, we would doing our, be doing our pres uh, preservation award ceremony, which we can't do in person this year, but I would like to congratulate the winners Robert DeFebo is getting the Architecture Award for his, the restoration of his 1746 farmhouse, which is quite beautiful. Anna Marie Ruggiero is getting the Special Focus Award for her two cookbooks, uh, both of which give a little background on the ethnic cultures of the area and have some delicious recipes. In, and having been home cooking for three months, I can attest to how great the recipes are. The third person really wanted to remain anonymous, but I think I can say that she's getting the initiative award for longstanding and exemplary work for the Hunter Martin Museum. So congratulations to all of them. We continue also with the University of Penn project, which we started with the generous um, grant from the Northampton County Department of Community and Economic Development block grant and uh, they are narrowing down the many great ideas they had for industrial sites in our area and are creating one or a couple of combined plans uh, that can move us forward and create a historical and recreational area that can also be an economic driver. So they're going great guns and we anticipate they may actually have a, uh, a visualization of that, a program about that. Uh, completed and ready for public consumption by the end of August. So we'll keep you apprised of that. Uh, we also, I just want to announce, we do have an intern this summer who's working virtually. Uh, Cullen King is doing some outside research for us and working from home. One of the things he's helped coordinate is a survey about your experience with the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you go to our Facebook page, you'll find a link. You'll be able to uh, answer some of the questions on the survey. And the reason we're doing this is since it's, it's such an extraordinary event, uh, we figure that in a few years, people will want to know what it was like. So please try that out. It, it can be as quick as you want it to be. You can linger and make your answers more extensive if you'd like, but check the Facebook page. And I think that's it for the announcements. Um, so I would like to now introduce Walt Cole, who is a former uh, Penargil history teacher. He's a local historian. He is a meticulous researcher and uh, has done so many of the oral history interviews that we have at the Heritage Center, also for projects, community projects like the, the uh, Bangor Penargil football game anniversary. 
and most recently worked on uh, the Weona Park project. And the park is soon going to celebrate its 100th anniversary. So I'll turn this over to you, Walt, and uh, we look forward to the presentation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, in honor of the 100th anniversary of Weona Park, the committee decided to plan three activities. The first activity was to print a calendar. And this calendar would have different recent and old pictures of the park, plus many events that happened uh, in the history of Penargel. There are still a few of those copies left. Uh, they're $15. If anyone would be interested, they can contact me. The uh, second thing that the committee planned to do was to have a celebration a two-day celebration. And the third activity was I would write a book about the 100th anniversary. Now that was the original plan and that was before COVID-19. The um, calendar was completed and sold. The celebration has been postponed the next year. In fact, today's June 17th and the celebration was supposed to be this weekend. And the book I'm hoping to release in the fall but it might be delayed. The reason it would be delayed is one of my sources is the Bangor Daily News, which is a microfilm in the Bangor Library. And uh, if I can have access to that newspaper sometime this summer or even early fall, uh, I could have the book out in the fall. Otherwise, I might have to postpone it until next year. So I'm hoping that uh, the book will be available in the fall. Now, in addition to the Bangor Daily News, there were many other sources that were available. This was the uh, uh, 1964 Penardial Past and Present book written by Marjorie May. Uh, another source was the Ring the Bells of Old Penardial, which was the centennial book from 1982. And this is really uh, the definitive book uh, on Penardial. And then I also had access to uh, a 1923 uh, travel, it was, it, it was labeled as a tourist brochure. Uh, it was a wonderful 17 page booklet made in 1923, including eight pictures of what the park looked like in 1820, uh, 1923. And the purpose of the brochure was, was to promote uh, tourism, promote We Own a Park. And then the last source, as far as books I had, is a book that Marjorie May made in 1970, which included the 1923 book. And this was a 50th anniversary book and it updated the park from 23 to 1970. And it included uh, 19 uh, additional pictures. Um, now, I also had asked for emails and I did receive several emails and some of those comments are gonna be included in the book. And I also asked for uh, some oral history interviews and some of those will be in the book also. Some very interesting stories from those. Um, concerning the oral history interviews, people that I had interviewed many years ago, I may have briefly asked them about the park and some of their comments are also included. For example, a comment by, uh, several comments by Bob Doney uh, a comment by Kermit Peicher and so on. Now, another source that was very uh, helpful and extensive amount of material, especially in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, was uh, the morning call. So those are all my sources. I decided to start the book with um, a short description of uh, COVID-19. Um, there were two reasons for this one, this pandemic has had an effect on the park. Uh, it closed the park just last week. It was open to walk through, but it closed the park. Uh, it postponed our celebration. Uh, it canceled the summer sounds concerts that are held Sunday evenings. And it's going to have an impact on the park's future. The second reason I included COVID-19 uh, in the beginning of the book was because it is a major historic event. And you're aware of it, uh, you're living through it. But if someone would read the book in 15 years from now, 
uh, they they may not be aware of of the impact of it. And I did include some examples of how it affected uh, Pinard when the slate fell. So after the description on COVID-19, I have an introduction. And the main thing I have in the introduction is trying to explain what was Pinardville like in 1919. Well, Pinardville was similar to Bangor, similar to Wind Gap. It was a prosperous community. Pinardville in 1919 had 14 quarries, five hotels, seven churches, two railroads, trolley and passenger service, and it was a major repair shops for the Lehigh New England Railroad. Now those repair shops had recently been moved to uh, between Bangor and Penardro on 512 behind Penn Jersey service station. You can still see the large red brick building uh, as you go past that site and that was the major repair shop of a major repair shop of the Lehigh uh, New England Railroad. Also in 1919, most people worked in Penardrill, they shopped in Penardrill, and their social life was in Penardrill, which means in the summer, their social life was we own a park. In 1919, if you walked along Pennsylvania Avenue, West Pennsylvania Avenue especially, South Robinson, <coughs> West Main Street, you would not probably find a vacant storefront. It was a prosperous town. There were many civic organizations. There was tremendous pride in the town. It was a close-knit community. There was a willingness to respond and volunteer to help build a park. Now, when I was first married in, in the early 1970s, our neighbor was a gentleman in his 80s, and he had helped build the park. And he had such pride in the fact that and he would say that we built the park without any outside help. We didn't have any state aid. We didn't have any federal aid. We didn't use any local taxes. It was all from an outpouring of support from all walks of life within the town. And he had great pride in that. Following the introduction, I'm going to have a timeline. Now this timeline is over nine pages long and it includes over 165 events. Some of the events deal with the park itself. For example, May 30th, 1921, and that was Memorial Day, you had the grand opening, the first opening of the park. July 4th, 1923, you had the first ride on the carousel. The first ticket was sold for $100. The first ride cost $10 a ticket, and they made enough money the first day to pay off the cost of the carousel. The timeline will also include concerts and other forms of entertainment. For example, July 17, 1926, the Odd Fellows had a gathering. There was a concert by the Pinardro Cornet Band and by the Ukulele Girls Band of Catasauqua. The Ukulele Girls Band of Catasauqua. 1929 also, in August 29, 1929, at a, at a Masonic gathering, you had a concert by the Boys Harmonica Band of Philadelphia. Now, how in the world did a harmonica band of Philadelphia in 1929 end up at We Own a Park? That in itself would be an interesting story. One of my hopes for this book is that as readers read about these events, they can imagine themselves going back in time, attending the events. Imagine being at the band shell, listening to a ukulele, a band or a harmonica band. Um, the timeline would also include other events. For example, September 24th, 1930, Gifford Pinchot, the Republican candidate for governor, gave an 8.30 speech, PM speech at Weona Park. He would visit Weona Park four times. Now perhaps he visited the park so many times because he lived up in Milford, wasn't that far from Penargel. But in any event, he visited four times. One interesting event happened in September 9th, 1932, when they were going to have a parachute drop, jump at the athletic field. The goal was to land at the athletic field. Well, he got a little off track and he landed by St. Elizabeth's Cemetery. The morning call said, well, at least he missed the quarries. Uh, can you imagine being a witness to that event? Maybe you had never seen a plane before. I mean, maybe you had never seen a parachute jump before. 
So uh, that must have been an exciting event, and no one was injured. After the timeline, in the next section, we'll talk about the beginning of the park. So Penardville played their sports at Albion Commons. Albion Commons is the present green and white field on West Main Street. They played at the southern part of that field complex next to a quarry. As the quarry grew, the quarry pile also became higher, and the owners of the quarry who owned the land were afraid that fans would stand on the quarry pile and maybe injure themselves. So they told them, the town, that they couldn't use the field. So Howard Young, who was really the father of Weona Park, he was looking for another site in Penargel. Well, if you know the area of Penargel, there aren't too many sites available. But he did find one site where the present field is now in the park, and it was 17 acres of underbrush. In fact, the brochure would say it was unsightly bog and brush patched with second growth trees. He called a meeting to see if there would be support for this park and 150 attend the meeting. And they discussed the ability, the possibility of establishing an athletic field. One of the 115 people at the meeting was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church. And he suggested, instead of just having a field, why don't we build a park? Well, they thought that was a good idea. So there are three important dates in, in the founding of the park. In 1919, they purchased the land for $5,000. In 1920, the Penardial Park and Athletic Association received a charter. And in 1921 Memorial Day weekend, the park opened for the first time. Now, for some reason, 1920 seems to be the date of celebrations. So the 50th anniversary was 1970. The 65th was 1985. The 75th was 1995. And the 100th was supposed to be 2020. When you think about these events that had to happen to actually even have a park, you have to wonder, what if? What if the quarry company had allowed them to stand on the piles of slate? What if the three owners, three owners own different sections of the park, what if the three owners had been unwilling to sell, sell or only two of them? We'd have a much different sized park. What if the call for the meeting where 150 people attended, how about if hardly anyone attended? And what if the pastor hadn't attended the meeting and made the suggestion, why don't we have a park and the field? So various events had to fall into place. So you have the community spirit, the community joined together, and after two years of hard work, the park opened up. The next section of the book will talk about how the park changed over the past 100 years and all the various uses of the park over the past hundred years. Since the beginning, the park was very popular. It was a very popular site for reunions. In 1930, the morning call said, there are many picnics booked at the Penargel Resort. No, the article, the title said Penargel Resort. Many, many picnics booked at the Penargel Resort. There were 50 family names, I've listed in the book from 1922 to 1945, there's over 65 different families that had reunions at Weona Park. The number of people and the events at one time th that the park could handle was surprising to me. August 10th, 1932, there were 18 different groups that met on one day at the park. There were four reunions. There were three Bangor Welsh churches there was a scout troop, there were several sun Sunday schools, classes, and it was also the day of the swimming championships. All of that on one day. The size of the re reunions surprised me. Many of them had over 200 members. There was a Labar reunion that had 350 members. Most of the reunions and the largest attendance at the reunions happened during the 1930s probably because of the depression. In addition to the reunions, there were many church events at the park. There were youth and adult groups. There were missionary aid societies. There were religious rallies, speakers, evangelists, sacred concerts, and many, many Sunday schools. 
there were many slate belt churches that attended events at Weona Park. Eight churches from Bangor, seven from Penargel, five from Wingap, three from Portland, and you had East Bangor Stone Church and other slate belt communities having gatherings, picnics and so on, family reunions or whatever, but these were all churches. What surprised me most was how many gatherings, church gatherings were at the park outside the slate belt. There were 26 different churches outside the slate belt that came to Weona Park. There were four different communities in New Jersey, Belvedere, Blairstown, Dover, Stewartsville. In fact, Belvedere had three different churches that came to Weona Park. And we're talking about the 1930s. There were seven different churches from the Poconos, seven different churches, including Mountain Home. Now these churches came to Weona Park instead of some site in the Poconos. In addition to uh, the reunions then, uh, these other organizations and so on, uh, there were over 60 different organizations in addition to reunions and church groups, over 60 different. And I've tried to list all of these. I'm sure I've missed some family reunions, church groups, and other gatherings that attended and used the park. So the question is, why was the park so popular? Why so many events? Well, one, it was a large wooded park. Keep in mind that the park includes the north side of 512. It had a large pool, had a large athletic field, had the carousel, had miniature golf. In the 50s, it had a community center. Until recently, with reunions and groups, you could buy a $7 bracelet, and that would allow you to swim, golf, use the carousel all day long. Another reason that the park was very attractive was its wonderful band shell. There were hundreds of concerts and speakers that used the band shell, and I'm going to try to list as many as I can in the book. Now, yet another thing you have to consider is we own a park opened up in 1921. Bangor Park was around 1938. So it was really the only large park in the slate belt. So there were many kinds of concerts at the park. Most communities had community bands and they all played at the park. And the most famous community band played many times at the park and that would be the Allentown Band. The first time I found a concert was back in 1924. But from 1939 to 1961, except for the war years, the Allentown Band played Sunday of Labor Day weekend all of those years. There were community bands, there were youth bands. Labor Day Monday was an exciting, after the, after the parade many years you had, uh, especially during the 50s and 60s, you had drum and bugle corps exhibitions. Many drum and bugle corps gave exhibitions in the athletic field after the parade, and that included uh, the famous uh, Bangor Yellow Jackets. Something else that uh, there were all these concerts were male choruses. Now this goes back to a Cornish and Welsh tradition. The Cornish and Welsh were famous for their male choruses. In fact, they're still famous for their male choruses. So for over 20 years, the Op Apollo Male Chorus of Bangor gave concerts. The Penardrill Men's Chorus gave concerts. There was one concert in the 30s. I would have loved to have been at this concert. There were 18 male choruses. Each male chorus gave one selection and then they gave three combined selections. There was a total of 500 male singers. What an experience that must have been. More recently, a tradition that was popular was to have barbershop quartets, and there's been many barbershop quartets that gave concerts at Weona Park. So this book will attempt to list the bands, the choruses, and so on that performed at Weona Park. The book includes the history of the carousel, the famous stencil carousel, why it's valuable in the restoration, the history of the swimming pool, 
It also includes the many celebrations, both, both national and local celebrations, holidays that occurred at the park. Now, one of the um, earliest celebrations, and this goes back to the very founding of Penargel, was something called August 1st. It was called Excursion Day, and this goes back to Cornwall, England again. It was a tradition to have the day off and go somewhere. And in the early days of Penargel, much of the town would go somewhere on an excursion. Now, by 1921, it was called Penargel Day. And at this Penargel Day, August 1st event, it would be all the Protestant churches, Sunday schools, except the Salvation Army. They went someplace else. And I'm not sure why they weren't included in this or wouldn't attend this. And it was called the Union Sunday School Picnic. So that was a special day, Penargel Day. Stores and industries would be closed. There would be sports and athletic contests. Merchants would provide prizes. The last Penargel Day was 1941, three months before Pearl Harbor. Another religious celebration for over 20 years was St. Rock's Festival. And St. Rock's is located in West Bangor from the 1930s to the 1950s. And they would have baseball games, concerts, and several years they had fireworks. Memorial Day was a one day celebration. It was normally the opening of the park and several years it was when the pool opened. After World War II, it became a two day celebration. It continues today and it's known as springtime in the park. It's sponsored by the fire company. The 4th of July celebration was also a one day celebration. After World War II, it became several days depending on what day of the week the 4th of July fell. During the 20s and early 30s, the fire company had a two-day carnival in August. This is before the fire company sponsored the Labor Day celebration. So in the 1930s, imagine what the park provided. You had six different celebrations. You had Memorial Day, St. Rock's, the 4th of July, August 1st, the Fireman's Carnival, and of course, the biggest celebration of the year would be Labor Day. Now, Labor Day in the early days was a two-day celebration, Saturday and Monday. Saturday in the early days was a farmer's celebration. They actually had equipment and animals in the athletic field, and they did that up to about 1940. Monday was a labor Labor Day uh, for, or to, to sponsor labor unions and so on. In fact, they would have a parade maybe with 1,500 labor union workers parading. In the 1930s at the Labor Day celebration, they had the first Greece pig race. One year in the 1930s, they had a duck race. They put a duck in the pool. They had 10 boys try to catch the duck. They actually had another race where two girls tried to catch the duck. Um, if you won the pig race, you kept the pig. I don't know if they, I guess they kept the ducks. Uh, that would have been interesting to see. I believe they only did that one year. So these celebrations have several things in common. First of all, you didn't have a celebration on a Sunday because it was Sunday. These celebrations always included baseball games and they would always have two games a day. These celebrations many years included speakers, whether it was patriotic speakers, famous farm speakers, labor speakers, well known. You would have concerts, you would have fireworks. Some Labor Day weekends, you had two fireworks, Saturday and Monday. Surprisingly, the biggest attraction at these events was the baby parade. There were several years where the headline said, Labor Day Pray to include, uh, Labor Day celebration to include a baby pray. Another he headline said, 2,000 watch the Penargel Labor Day baby pray. The band would lead the baby pray as 
they went around the infield diamond and different prizes would be awarded. Now there were also some very special local celebrations that uh, used Weona Park. And the biggest celebration Penardro ever had was the 1982 Penardro Centennial Celebration. In 1999, you had the Cornish Celebration. It was the 10th gathering of the Cornish Cousins, uh, the Cornish American Heritage Society, uh, which started having uh, celebrations every other year starting in 1982. So it was the first time it was east of the Mississippi and uh, Penardro was a, a great setting because we had a Cornish uh, atmosphere uh, in Penardrill. Uh, over 400 Cornishmen attended from all over uh, America, Canada, England, obviously Cornwall, Australia, and so on. Some other celebrations that will be briefly mentioned in the book will be the 50th, the 65th, the Bicentennial. I'm also going to include the planned 100th celebration, even though that's going to be next year. I've already mentioned the popularity of baseball. Reunions, gatherings, celebrations, all included baseball. It seemed like every gathering included a baseball game. Krell Shoe Company in the 1920s had a picnic. The baseball game was the married workers against the single workers. The businessmen of Penardro had a picnic also in the 1920s. The baseball game was the upper merchants against the lower merchants. There were many leagues that used the park, the field. In 1931, the morning call said practically every night there's a baseball game. The Blue Mountain League, which was founded in the early 1900s, before 19, I think it was around 1999, uh, used Weona Park. 1925, there was an industrial lake, including four quarries and two railroad companies. From 1928 to 1939, you had the Northampton County AA League, 12 teams in that league. More recently, you had the Penardro Phillies, which was an over 40 baseball league. And the Penardro A's, which played in the Lehigh Valley Senior League, which was an over 55 league. You had youth baseball, American Legion, Babe Ruth. There were three times in the 70s where the state Babe Ruth tournament was held at Weona Park. For a few years, the high school softball team used the field. Little League, except for the first year, did not use the little, uh, the Weona Park field. They used the green and white field. There were some interesting and unusual baseball games. In 1935, there was a donkey baseball game. Can you imagine a donkey baseball game? I don't know how you would play that game, but they played it. In 1987, there was a kids to kids softball game. Now this team came from Florida. The minimum age was 75. They had one player, 101. And they played slow pitch softball against a girls softball team. The coach was concerned because the girls weren't used to slow pitch. There were several African-American teams that also uh, visited Weona Park. In 1935, the New York Black Yankees played at Weona Park. Bob Doney, as a boy, remembers seeing the catcher of the New York Yankees hit a home run into the swimming pool. 1958 was the last African-American baseball game at Weona Park. One of the teams that came there was the Indianapolis Clowns with the ageless King Tut, who had played for 20 years. His last name was King. Football used the park. In the early days, you would have high school football in the morning, adult football in the afternoon. So from 1922 to 1961, the odd years games, except for World War II when the field was unplayable, the odd year games were played at Weona Park. Adult football during the 20s, during the 30s, during the 20s, it was just called the Penardro AA. They had a second football team called the Penardro AC, which stood for Athletic Club. 
In the 1930s, the Penardro AA, and I believe this is why they were called this, the famous team was called the Night Riders. They had rented lights from Stroudsburg that were used during baseball season. They installed them and they played Tuesday and Friday night games. Imagine today if a, a football game team played two games a week. Very successful, winning over 90% of their games, the Penardro Knight Riders. Now, this book is also going to include youth activities. In 1949, they started a seven week recreation program. Many years, they had over 200 youths. The park had a Boy Scout Lodge, Boy Scout Hall, Girl Scout summer camps. In the 20s and 30s, up to the early 40s, the senior class would have a class day at the park. Now, it varied. Some years, the senior class would go out to the park with underclassmen and they would have afternoon activities. They would go home. They would have meet in front of the school, which was on Pennsylvania Avenue, and they would march out to uh, the band shell for uh, an evening program. That was normally the day before, uh, before graduation. In the 1990s, Penardro had a principal called uh, Mr. Murphy, and he started field day at Weona Park. And uh, the whole school, and that was quite a scene, they would, they would march from the high school down to the field, have a day of activities, and then uh, around 2.30, go home. Other topics included in the book will be organizations that contributed. There were many organizations that contributed to the prosperity and growth of the park. The first famous one was the Ladies of the Park Improvement League. Around 20 women started to make pasties on Wednesdays. That became Pasty Day in Penardrill. They would also serve dinners. They raised thousands of dollars and for over 20 years, they gave the money to the park. By 1941, they had made 125,000 pasties. Now, the pa another group of pasty ladies uh, uh, made pasties at the park during the 1950s. There were other civic organizations that had many contributions. The Exchange Club did, the Women's Club, the Fire Company, many contributions to the park. Now, I don't know if this is the way it was done in other communities. I don't know if this is unusual or not, but the fact that so many civic organizations and the Fire Company contributed. More recently, the Weona Park, park Pals existed for over 20 years. And during this 20 year period, they raised over $54,000. All of that money went for park improvements. Other topics I'll include in the book are political and protest groups, the future of the park. And then I'll include some of the comments from emails and the memories and the oral history, which has some pretty interesting stories. At present, even though it's not complete, the book is about 68 pages long. There's going to be an appendix. There's going to be pictures. There's also going to be some ads to help defray the cost of the book. And also to, um, uh, it, it, this is a fundraiser for We Own a Park. The book is not finished. Uh, I, I hope to add more interviews and more momentums, uh, memories, uh, and more pictures. And, and I hope that the book will be available uh, this fall. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments, reminiscences, reminiscences <laughs> to add? That's a great job, Walt. Well, thank you, Mark. Well, what, um, just mention like one or two of these political protests that were at the park. <laughs> what were they and when? Well, uh, one group that met during the late, a couple times in the late 20s, and they actually prayed it in the Labor Day parade. 
and they had a meeting where 500 people attended was the KKK. Uh, uh, they had one speaker one year come from Atlanta, one from uh, Texas, they had um, one from Easton. Uh, but I don't really think uh, that that really took hold in Penargel uh, because there were instances of actually uh, in the 30s even, there was a Sunday school picnic, swimming uh, from Stroudsburg and East Stroudsburg um, African-Americans coming down to Wiona Park. Um, uh, but that was probably the one that surprised me the most. Others, there, there, there was an organization formed uh, in the uh, in the eighties, uh, concerned citizens, and they were against tax increases. They were against the, one of their big protests was against the expansion of Wind Gap uh, Middle School. Uh, until that time, you had seventh through twelfth grade at Penarville High School. So the plan was to create a middle school, and, and they were definitely against that. They were also against tax increases. They were against uh, the one year the, the water company wanted to increase the water ta uh, rates uh, 147 percent. Uh, Cinegrove, that's a recent one. Uh, there were a couple meetings uh, about the Cinegrove. Uh, heat recovery plant, um, expansion of waste management. There were some meetings uh, concerning that. Um, all, a lot of political candidates local uh, would, would have events, even things like Northampton County Democratic Women's or Northampton County Republican Women, uh, local politicians. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, I think Tom Ridge came to pass when he was running for governor. Um, I remember Don Ritter had come through the park. I think he, he, came, he came through the area. I think he came through the area like uh, on a bicycle, the whole, the whole uh, his whole district that he was representing. Um, so even today it's used, it's used for political events. Um, Any other questions? Well, I have, this is Carolyn Shafflin, and uh, my husband had to leave for a meeting. Oh, okay. And I was sitting here just listening to the program, and I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> so I stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I have to say, you know, it gives me so much uh, pride. Yeah. I come from uh, New York, and we don't have this kind of stuff, this small time fellowship, camaraderie, history. And to hear you talk with such pride and passion, Walt, um, it was very, very interesting. And I thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure I'll pull it up for Shap because he does not do anything on the computer. <laughs> so I'll pull it up so he can hear it. But it was very interesting. And thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Walt. It was very interesting. Thank you, June. Did you ever come over to the park much when you were young? Yes, I was there every weekend, Friday and Saturday in the summers. And I know where you probably were. <laughs> at the band, at the stand. At, at the refreshment stand. That was the hopping place, wasn't it? That was the hopping place. The beehive during the school year and the upper refreshment stand by the carousel in the summer. Yep. I've seen you dance at the stand, June. You still got it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they left. Uh, any well, other questions? Well, you, you by any chance, did Bob Doney by any chance say the name of that? Uh, catcher no that's that's almost an unbelievable <laughs> yeah. you're talking with home plate would be in the far corner 
That's right. And he hit it in the pool. Yep. Over the fence in the pool. Wow. Yep. You know, um, these these African American teams were really good. I mean, uh, it's interesting that they. I guess the last one was the Indianapolis Clowns, and and they were they were still traveling around in 1962. I think they were the last one, but they were much more than clowns. They were really. T- I mean, Satchel Play- Page, uh, Hank Aaron was with them just a few months. I'm I'm going to try to look to. I doubt very much if Hank Aaron was was that we on a part because they only played with them three months. But, and eventually several others uh, went under the major leagues, but they, they, ha- they were entertaining, but they were also really, really fantastic baseball players. Yeah. Like the house of David. That they, was one. Did they, did they play at Winona Park also? Yeah. Yes. They came once. Yeah. That name was mentioned. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Walt. That was terrific. Uh, and You're uh, welcome. everybody stay tuned. Uh, you know, later on, we'll have more of these programs. And uh, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Good night. Night. Good night.